Hello everyone, this is Jonathan Little. I'm here with episode 203 of Weekly Poker Hand, and we have a pretty fun one today. We are, again, going over hands from this 5-5 game that took place at Stone's Gambling Hall in Sacramento, California. Uh, let's go ahead and get right to it. It folds to Casey in the hijack seat who raises to $30 with Ace of Hearts, Jack of Clubs, which is obviously perfectly fine. Um, I believe there's a $5 straddle, by the way. We see under the gun, quote-unquote, called, which is one big blind, and it seems like that's been consistent on all of these hands, so it may be a 5-5-5 game. I have never played a three-blind game where all blinds are exactly the same, and I don't really know what that does to poker. <laughs> I imagine it just makes... Well, normally, if it goes something like 2-5-10... The player in the small blind should be really tight because they have to worry about the two players yet to act and position on them. But this game may be different. Um, I imagine the small blind is still is a pretty big disadvantage if there's a raise, but probably not quite as much as normal because the big blind is going to be way less likely to defend because they don't have so much in the pot. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see if anything happens over the next few videos and we'll discuss it as we move forward. Anyway, in this hand, Casey... Alexa to raise with Ace of Hearts, Jack of Clubs to 30 bucks. I would make my standard raise to about 25 in this scenario, I think. Gets around to Frank on the button, who calls with Jack 10 of Hearts, which is perfectly fine, perfectly standard. Then Peter in the small blind also has Ace Jack offsuit. And from out of position, I would probably turn this hand into a bluff. The hands I am bluffing in this spot are usually going to be hands that are junkie suited connected hands like 10-8 suited or 10-7 suited or jack-9 suited or jack-8 suited or maybe hands like 6-4 uh, suited. Hands that should fall below my, my opponent's calling of my 3-bet range quite often as well as some hands like big offsuit hands that are going to be really tough to play. So this is going to be stuff like either ace-10, king-jack, queen-jack, or ace-jack and king-queen offsuits, depending on what I think about my opponent's initial raising strategies. As they're raising wider, you can be a little bit happier calling with stuff like king-queen and ace-jack. If they're raising tighter, you probably want to start three-betting these hands instead. And if I did three-bet them in this spot, I would make it pretty big. I'd make it something like 170. This is something you see almost no players doing in these games. They instead like to call and go from there. So anyway, Peter does call with ace-jack offsuit, big blind, and straddle both fold because they have total garbage. So good fold with the total garbage. Flop comes king-7-3, two hearts, giving Frank a flush draw with jack-10 of hearts, and Casey with ace-jack of ace jack with the ace of hearts, the backdoor flush draw. So Casey should probably make a small continuation bet in this spot. Pot's 100. I would go something like 35 bucks with a wide range, and this that certainly includes this hand. He did bet 45, so a little bit bigger than I would have gone. This is, again, something that you will see a lot in the smaller stakes games. People do not use small bet sizes very often at all. It's very important that you ask yourself, how frequently do I want to be betting on this flop? That's not the precise question you want to be asking, but if you ask yourself, okay, is this flop dry? If the flop's dry, the answer is yes. Okay, how often do I want to be betting? The answer is often. If the flop's dry and you want to be betting often because you have a range advantage, presumably, you want to use small bet sizes in general. So this is a somewhat dry board, king, seven, three, two hearts. You have the backdoor heart draw, so it's not even that bad if a heart peels off. This is a spot where Casey's definitely going to want to bet small, and a small bet is usually something like a third pot. Um, okay, so anyway, he does bet 45, and now it's on to Frank on the button with jack, 10 of hearts for a flush draw. I would definitely call this in position. If he was out of position, I would be way more inclined to raise. With your draws in position, it is fine to call. You do not have to just like automatically raise. And that's because if you call and the flush comes in on the turn, well, now you kind of control the action. You can bet and put money in the pot. If you're out of position, instead, on the turn, you're often going to check. Your opponent's going to check behind, and then you just don't get to play a big pot when you make a flush. So this is a spot where uh, Frank can easily call. And um, Peter in the small blind with ace-jack offsuit clearly just has to fold now because he has nothing. He had ace-jack, but no backdoor flush draw. Turn is an eight of hearts. Frank just drills it on the turn, has the flush. Hello. 
Should Casey keep betting with his Ace of Hearts draw? I think he can go either way. If he thinks Frank's range is quite wide, then I would just keep betting if you think Frank is capable of folding. So far, we've only seen a few hands from Frank here at Weekly Poker Hand, but from playing with him, he seemed pretty splashy, but watching him play over the last few hands, he actually seems to be pretty snug when he has his marginal stuff. Like, say he was sitting here with 7-6, he would certainly just fold it to another bet. So for that reason, I would probably just keep betting with this ace-jack. You're probably going to get him to fold most things besides a king or better. And I think that's okay. If you bet this and get raised, it's pretty unfortunate. But what's the alternative, right? You can check, and then if he bets, you check call? That's not great because, again, you're playing this draw from out of position. It's going to be hard to get paid if Casey does make a flush on the river. So I think Casey should probably just keep betting. And I would bet on the bigger side. When I'm betting this turn, it's going to be a lot of flushes, ace high, heart draws, and sets. So I think you can go for a pretty big sizing with that range. Checking's fine, though. I mean, I don't think it's absurd. Especially if you think Frank's going to be really passive, then checking becomes a little bit better. Frank pretty quickly makes a bet, though. Pot's 190 bucks. How much should Frank bet with this flush? I would go ahead and bet large. And if I was in Frank's shoes, I would start turning a hand like a 7 into a bluff. It was king 7-3, turns an 8. If you did call the flop with something like ace-3 or ace-7 or 7-6, seven, I'm sorry, if you, the, yeah, if you called the flop with those, I would definitely keep, or I definitely start betting because now when Casey checks, he's usually going to have either some sort of a draw or some sort of a reasonable bluff catching hand. And that's going to be stuff like a king or maybe something like pocket queens. So when you bet the turn, if you bet something like 170 into this 190 pot, that's going to put all those hands in a pretty bad spot, right? And then if he does happen to call you on the turn, you can keep blasting the river. And you're going to get him to fold a lot of his range, unless he's balancing his range really well. What a lot of the best players do is they start checking the turn with ace-king or random two pairs like ace seven, or maybe even some weaker flushes. Or maybe even the nut flushes, looking to check call to give you every opportunity to bluff. So um, it's hard to play these spots against good players, but quite often people have holes in their game and they are playing somewhat face-up. So anyway, if I was in Frank's shoes, I would bet on the bigger side, like 145 or bigger. It looks like he bet something like $80, though. The problem with betting 80 so he did bet 85 The problem with betting 85 is that now you give Casey a reasonable price to call with his heart draws, and notice here, any reasonable heart draw is going to be a nine, a queen, or a an ace. And the aces and the queens, you really don't want in the pot. And right here, you're almost pricing them in. Obviously, you're not quite, pri qu not quite pricing them in because he's getting about three to one pot odds, and he's only going to get there about 20% of the time or a little bit less. Well, given you have two hearts in your hand, I guess it's way less. But I still think you probably want to go a hair bigger just to get value out of the top pairs and whatnot. As we see here, Casey's going to win 16% of the time accounting for the dead cards. So it's a slightly bad call. Not that Casey has any way of knowing that. Certainly Frank could just be floating and bluffing on the turn. River is a five of hearts. So Casey gets there, he makes the flush. Now this is a spot that every small stakes player has seemed to email me about. I get this email about once a week. When the flush card comes in on the river, or the fourth flush, or the straight, or whatever, when the obvious draw completes, and my opponent bets into me, what should I do? It's the most common question I get. One of the most common questions. And the answer is it depends a lot on what your opponent's strategy is. What do we know about Casey? Do we think Casey is frequently leading on four flush rivers for value, or as a bluff? When people lead in this spot, it is very often going to be with a premium made hand or total garbage. So what total garbage could Casey have? That's the first question you want to ask. Would Casey ever take a hand like a king and turn it into a bluff? Or a hand like, I don't even know, 9-8 for a turned pair and turn it into a bluff on the river? Probably not, right? Most people don't take decent made hands and turn them into bluffs. So right off the bat in this scenario, we are searching hard for hands that would like to lead as a bluff. Um, next question is, will your opponent overvalue any worse hands by leading with them? Imagine Casey had a, an inferior flush, like a nine of hearts or a six of hearts. Would he like to lead with those? Most people don't like to lead with nine of hearts and six of hearts for value because it's kind of hard to get called when you're ahead, right? So that also doesn't make a lot of sense. So in this scenario, I think 
Frank should at least consider folding. Now, I don't know how much Casey led for. As your opponent leads for a smaller amount, you're getting better pot odds, which should make you more inclined to call. That said, as your opponent leads for a smaller amount, they realize they're, they're giving you better pot odds, which means you have to call more often. Therefore, it makes it more likely some players have good hands. Um, but the answer to the question is, should you call when your opponents lead? Uh, it depends. <laughs> That's the answer. It depends on what your opponents are doing. If your opponents are very bluff happy and very capable of taking marginal made hands and turning them into bluffs, then I definitely say you need to be calling here pretty much every time. If they are not capable and they just never bluff here or rarely bluff here and they rarely overvalue, then you have an easy fold. There is no clear cut answer. In this spot though, if I was playing this hand blindly, I would just call and not worry about it. De and depending on the bet size, if you blasted it, I'd be more inclined to fold. Let's see if we get the bet size. It was 145 into a 400 pot. So um, when Frank calls, he has to put in 145 into a pot that's going to be about 650. So he needs to win about 20, 23% of the time. And he probably will. Unless Casey's literally never bluffing, in which case <laughs> you should fold, right? I think in general against tight, straightforward recreational players, you should strongly consider folding here. I think you're going to be shown premium hands more often than not, but as your opponents get better, well, maybe their leading strategy may go away completely, so you may, may not even have to face this spot. But in this scenario, if I'm playing a high-stakes tournament against a good player, I'm just calling with the Jack of Hearts every time. It would be nice if Frank had the Jack of Hearts without the Ten of Hearts, because then maybe your opponent's leading with the Ten of Hearts, which makes it a little bit nicer for you. But in this spot, I certainly don't fault Frank for the call, but knowing Casey takes this line with the nut flush, I would be way more inclined to at least consider folding in the future. When you do see this hand, though, do not take it to mean that Casey never bluffs. When you see the top of your opponent's range, it says nothing about the bottom of their range. So what you need to see here is Casey show up with the ace of hearts like seven times and no bluffs, or, you know, you need to start seeing him bluffing sometimes. But um, don't take one instance of a situation occurring to mean that's what happens in all instances, because that's just not how reality works. Anyway, this time Frank makes the call, he loses, Casey wins the pot, and we move on to the next hand. So that's going to be it for this episode of Weekly Poker Hand. I want to thank you for being here. Please let me know what you think about this new format of me reviewing live poker hands. A lot of you have been requesting this, so I figured I'd give it a try. If you don't like it, maybe we'll go back to the old way. But um, I'm, I'm all for innovating and trying to find things that you all enjoy. I want this to be the most enjoyable and educational poker podcast I can make it. So yeah, let me know what you think on Twitter at Jonathan Little, or you can leave a comment on YouTube or send me an email. I check all of that. So let me know, and I'll talk to you next week.